All right. Well, it's noon noon time here in Kansas. I uh, want to say thank you to everyone for joining us so far uh, for this presentation of Recovery Month, uh, Recovery Capital, Building Assets to Sustain Long-Term Recovery. Uh, before I turn it over to Alex, I want to introduce uh, DECA's Chief Clinical Officer, uh, Sandra Dixon. Um, she will have a few words to say uh, as we celebrate Recovery Month. Thanks, Alex. Um, I am sandwiched between two Alexes, so I will try to distinguish between the DECA Alex and our guest. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as Alex said, we are celebrating Recovery Month at DECA, and we are about halfway through that celebration. We have been uh, sharing recovery stories from um, many of our current and former treatment recipients. Uh, we have been uh, sharing opportunities with our staff to um, experience mindfulness and meditation. And we're really excited today to have Alex Ellswick back with DECA. He was a favored speaker last year at our statewide opioid conference. And the team was really excited to have him come back and join our celebration today. Before I do a formal introduction of Alex, I want to uh, thank a few people for helping be part of this Recovery Month celebration. Um, certainly the DECA Alex, um, who is producing today and who has been part of the work to put the various events together, uh, posting information on our social media. So Alex, we appreciate you as always. Um, also want to give uh, a big shout out to Ashley Countryman, our clinical coordinator at DECA's First Step at Lakeview. Uh, Ashley had the lead in putting this month's activities together and coordinating with the rest of the treatment leadership team. So I know Ashley is listening and so I appreciate uh, your work on that. Um, joining us today, in addition to DECA staff, we uh, have many community partners on the line and so we welcome all of you. And a special welcome to our folks who are currently engaged in DECA treatment services throughout the state. We know some of you are joining today and it's one of the reasons we are doing this via Zoom webinar so that we can protect the confidentiality of people who are currently engaged in treatment and starting that recovery journey. Um, we will have a bit of time at the end uh, for questions and um, the DECA Alex will facilitate that process for all of you. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Alex Ellswick. Uh, he is a tireless advocate for people with substance use disorders. He earned a BA from Center College as well as a master's degree and PhD from the University of Kentucky. And if you were on earlier, you heard me give him a bit of a bad time about that. He currently serves as an assistant extension professor for substance use prevention and recovery at the University of Kentucky. His knowledge and experience with addiction is multifaceted. Uh, his professional experience, nonprofit work, and research agenda all focus on long-term recovery. But most importantly, um, Alex is himself a person in long-term recovery from the chronic disease of addiction. So Alex, with that, welcome uh, back to DECA and to Kansas, at least virtually, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for having me back. I guess that means we didn't totally drop the ball uh, last year. Um, I, I was reminded just, I teach a class immediately before um, this time slot. And as I was walking across campus, uh, I was reminded why we do what we do. Not that we need constant reminders, but uh, I got a text that I lost a friend. Um, it's certainly not the first, I imagine it won't be the last, but another friend we've lost to overdose, another friend we've lost to the war on drugs. Um, another friend that, that in my opinion we lost because we haven't found a great way to manage addiction. We really haven't. Um, we have some primary treatments that are very effective, but we haven't really found a way to manage it as a whole. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so my name is Dr. Alex Ellswick. Uh, I'm Assistant Extension Professor of Substance Use Prevention and Recovery. Have you ever heard a more obnoxiously long title in your life? I promise I didn't ask for that. Um, so my, my, my research, everything that I do focuses on long-term recovery, really taking the zoomed out view on how we help people sustain improvements in their lives, um, people with substance use disorders. I have clinical experience. Uh, my master's degree was in a couple and family therapy program, and I didn't go to get licensed, but I did work in treatment settings um, for a few years, doing individual counseling, family counseling, group counseling. Um, I'm a co-founder of a nonprofit organization called Voices of Hope. So I'll kind of make this shameless plug now. We'll talk a little bit at the end as well about Voices of Hope, but we're a recovery community organization. So we don't offer treatment, 
Um, we were community based in building recovery capital. That's, that's what our whole approach is predicated on. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to accomplish a whole heck of a lot in one hour. I'm going to hit you with three different um, evidence based strategies for reducing stigma because I, I can't think of anything more important to do during recovery month. Um, we're going to revisit some of the brain science, but I want to be clear from the beginning that that I have no interest, even when I teach, teach classes, I have no interest in getting people to memorize structures of the brain, memorizing um, models or theories. There's no use for that. You, you who work on the ground, in the field, you need practical information you can actually do something with. And I promise you, I promise you, if you'll stick with me through this hour, all the way through, even through some of the, the academic weeds we're going to get down into, I, I really genuinely believe it'll change your understanding of addiction, even if only a little bit. And, and, I, and I believe, uh, arrogant though this may sound, that it will improve your ability to work with this audience. So just have that faith and, and let's go there together. Um, I, I mentioned we're going to employ three different stigma reduction strategies. Um, so the first is going to be I want to share just a tiny bit of my own story. I don't want to take up too much time, but, but research shows it's the most effective way to reduce stigma associated with addiction. They're called contact-based strategies. So we'll do that. Then I'm going to hit you with the science to explain why we need recovery capital, why we need to focus on the potential of recovery and not the pathology of addiction, why we need to focus on asset building irrespective of someone's um, approach to recovery. And I'll, then I'll explain a little bit about how we do that with voices. And then at the very end, I'm going to say a brief word about language and stigma, um, and then we'll open it for questions. So, so much to do. I'm going to move quickly. Just stick with me as best you can, all right? Um, so I was born and raised here in Lexington, Kentucky to truly uh, a really happy, healthy home. My parents um, didn't, didn't use drugs. I, I was never neglected. I was never abused. They didn't divorce. They drink alcohol very infrequently. Um, in that sense, it would seem I had very few risk factors for addiction. But there are two in particular that I would identify. The first is I likely inherited a genetic predisposition for addiction. Uh, behavioral genetics get complicated, but suffice it to say that my mom had seven uncles, four of whom had drug and alcohol problems. And that, that you know, research told me from the day I was born, I was more likely than the average person to have a problem. But secondly, and I think uh, just as importantly, from the time that I was very young, I've struggled with anxiety. And I've been diagnosed with a whole host of anxiety disorders, um, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, and a, and a far less common kind of anxiety called trichotillomania. Um, and trichotillomania is a, a hair pulling disorder that disproportionately affects adolescent females. So generally you'll see, you'll see 13 year old girls sitting in school and playing with their hair sort of so compulsively and aggressively that they pull out clumps and it becomes something that's distressing and that you're ashamed of and you try to hide. Well, don't ask me why, but for whatever reason, it was my eyebrows. And um, I was so anxious when I was sitting in class in like the seventh grade taking exams that I would be compulsively plucking at my eyebrows until they were completely gone. And I mean to tell you all, they were gone. I have a memory of going to family Thanksgiving in Ohio. And my uh, cousin, Eric, who was probably about eight years old at the time, sitting across the Thanksgiving dinner table and doing like a, a triple take. And he said to my mom, Aunt Shelly, what happened to Alex's eyebrows? They're all gone. He looks like a jack-o'-lantern which is like really not a nice thing to say. It's a very stigmatizing thing to say about someone with a mental health condition, but he was eight years old and we forgive him. And the reason that I bring that up is because it's such an important part of my story in my view. Um, because those anxiety disorders went undiagnosed until I was 21 years old and showed up at my second treatment center. So I spent the first 21 years of my life battling against something that I couldn't name, I couldn't claim, and I couldn't manage because I didn't know what it was. Um, and so I sought all sorts of um, <laughs> different ways to try to cope with how I felt. Some positive, some negative. Nothing ever worked as well as drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, I think the, that one of the greatest misconceptions about addiction is this idea that drug use is irrational. I think if you ask most people, they would, they would, they would suggest that drug use is irrational, that putting these harmful drugs in your body is counter to your best interest. But as as a person in recovery, as a person who li has lived experience, I would argue the opposite, that drug use is very, very rational, very sensible, logical thing to do to someone who's suffering. Uh, and, and, and I was suffering and I didn't know it, you know? I, I, I knew that I, I, mean, I was experiencing the distress, but I didn't know what to call it. Um, and as you can see, I've since recovered. I have these beautiful, luscious eyebrows now, thank God. Um, but, but it's been a long road. And, 
So, you know, I went through high school a lot like a typical adolescent. I, I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol about 15 years old, but there were no red flags, really. I think if you would talk to my classmates or my teachers, they would say that I was a good student and a good athlete, and I think a good kid, whatever that means. I don't, I don't know that I believe in good and bad people necessarily, but I don't think anybody would have said, here's a kid who's going to have a problem. And I went to college to play baseball, and I got into the freedom of being away from mom and dad, and I started experimenting with a lot of drugs. Um, on Valentine's Day 2010, about two weeks before our first baseball game, I got pulled over because my brake light was out, and I got arrested on a whole litany of felony drug trafficking charges. And I went to jail, and jail was a really bad experience for me. And that, you know, that sounds like the punchline to a joke, but it's not. Um, I'm a person with multiple mental disorders, and I'm not sure that, um, that a jail cell is the best place for me to rehabilitate. Um, when I got out of jail, in large part because of the privilege that I hold, the social location I hold, I'm a, you know, I, I'm a white guy who comes from a wealthy family, um, I was able to get my charges probated, and, uh, and, and drug testing was a condition of my probation with a year on the shelf. So if I violate the terms of my probation, I have to go serve a year. So for the first time in my life, at 18 years old, I swore off drugs and alcohol. And it's important to me that you all believe me when I say that it was sincere that it, it wasn't just to get somebody off my back. I really didn't want, um, want to do that anymore. And that worked for about two months. And then I had oral surgery to have my wisdom teeth removed. And I got prescribed a painkiller called oxycodone. You know, I took it as prescribed, but it didn't matter. I got addicted. And um, for the sake of time, I'll fast forward and tell you, you know, I just started using slowly more and more over the next two years until I had $150 a day pain pill addiction. Um, you know, I ended up making the switch to heroin. I moved to Cincinnati. I heard uh, Decca Alex talking about Cincinnati earlier. Spent a lot of time homeless in Cincinnati. Got introduced to heroin using a needle. I ended up homeless in four different cities in, um, in Nashville, in Lexington, in Cincinnati, in Dayton, Ohio. And I spent the very end of my addiction sleeping under a bridge in Dayton, under the Highway 35 overpass that runs through downtown and holding a cardboard sign that said homeless and hungry and panhandling for money and shooting heroin. Very much a, a living, breathing stereotype of heroin addiction. Um, and I was fortunate to walk out from, from under that bridge into a Salvation Army, which is a homeless shelter that really has very limited resources available in terms of like evidence-based strategies um, to support recovery. But I'm grateful that it was there. Um, and the first thing I'll tell you is that the first 30 days I spent at the Salvation Army are the worst 30 days of my entire life, hands down, bar none, without question. And for, for, for folks who don't have lived experience, this may be difficult to really wrap your, your mind around, but it was so much easier for me to be under a bridge. And it was so much easier for me to be in hotels with, with bed bugs um, than it was to be in, in early recovery. Uh, it's really unbelievably neurochemically miserable early in recovery, and it poses one of the great challenges that we don't talk a lot about, and we're going to discuss some of that in a little bit. But I ended up staying, and um, I ended up spending six months at this, at this shelter, probably the last three months that I was there, last two months at least, maybe the, the happiest two months of my entire life. Um, and what an incredible, just what an incredible journey to come to a place where I'm at a homeless shelter and I'm so, so grateful for my life at a homeless shelter. It's unbelievable. Um, but what's really critical is what happened when I got out because not only did I spend six months in inpatient, but then I did six weeks of intensive outpatient, unbroken, complete ten continuum of care. And then after six weeks of intensive outpatient care, I started working with a therapist. So I sort of by accident, without knowing what I was doing, had built this continuum of care that supported me throughout my recovery long-term. And I came to understand that to be a critical component of long-term success and recovery. And then I started looking at the research. I learned about this concept called recovery capital. And I came to understand that this is the stuff that people need. These assets, these resources, these connections, these opportunities, these make critical differences in people's recovery journeys. So that's where we're headed. But in order to make the case for why we need recovery capital, we got to talk about addiction and what it really is, what's really happening here. So, my favorite place to start this discussion um, is to parachute in the middle of probably the most contentious debate in the field, which is this idea of is addiction a choice or is addiction a disease? And 
for what it's worth, just so you know, I don't identify addiction as either. I, I see addiction as a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, so maybe more akin to a disease than a choice. But regardless, I, I really like the way that Nora Volkoff puts it. She's the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, she's essentially the United States leading scientist on addiction. And I also happen to have a picture of Dr. Volkov right here on my desk because I met her at the White House last year and it was the greatest moment of my life. So Nora Volkov would suggest that um, choices do not happen without a brain. It is the mechanism of choice. So the quality of a person's choices depend on the health of that mechanism. And I think that's a brilliant, brilliant way of saying it because no doubt people make choices within the context of their addiction. But if your brain is your choosing organ and we know that your brain is compromised, then it doesn't quite seem right to, to say flatly that people are making choices in their addiction. At best, they're making very strained, very compromised choices. So what is going on? Um, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot in the context of the opioid epidemic um, is that drugs cause addiction, that opioids are so, so addictive, so potent, people take them and they get addicted. And that's something we've thought for a long time. Um, in fact, all the way back to the middle of the 20th century is when we started really doing some research on, on addiction, coming to understand um, how it works. And so researchers put rats in a cage and they gave them two sources of water. One was plain water and one was water laced with morphine. And over and over again, the rats would return to consume the water laced with morphine and they would do it to the utter neglect of their basic needs. They would virtually stop eating in the pursuit of the morphine and they would die. And so the researchers concluded morphine's addictive. If you take morphine, you'll get addicted and you'll use it till you die. And that's fine. And that's generally the understanding that a lot of folks have today. But about 20 years later, some other researchers came along and said, you know, that's, that's a flawed study because it's not an accurate reflection of the way that people use drugs in the real world. Um, and so they created what's called Rat Park, uh, which is essentially heaven for rats. I'm telling you that if you and I were rats, this is prime real estate. This is where we want to go, right? Um, because there are all the toilet paper rolls to crawl through and the gerbil wheels to exercise on and you're in this thriving community with all your rat buddies. And then the researchers replicated the study. They introduced those same two sources of water. Um, but this time in Rat Park, the results are completely different. The vast majority of the rats um, don't like the water laced with morphine, presumably because they think it tastes bitter. And those who did like it um, seem to be able to use it in moderation. And so we can kind of conclude two things from that. One is that drugs alone are not sufficient to cause an addiction. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. And if you think about it, that's not a surprising finding because many of you have probably been prescribed opioids following some type of procedure. And four fifths of you at the very least um, didn't get addicted, right? Didn't have that experience. Even if you became physically dependent, you didn't get addicted. So we know that there's more going on with addiction than simply making a choice to use a drug. Um, and, and so it's funny because some researchers came along and criticized that study and said, fine for rats, but we can't generalize those results to human beings. And ironically, there was a very similar naturalistic experiment being carried out in Vietnam because we had an entire generation of young people, primarily young men, go overseas and fight in these horrific conditions. It's been well documented how, how horrific conditions were in Vietnam. And, and there's reports coming back to the White House that as, as many as 20% of our soldiers in Vietnam are using heroin on a daily basis. And so you can imagine the consternation in the White House, um, what will be the social and economic costs, consequences of a, a fifth of our military coming home addicted. But instead, what happened? Um, just like in Rat Park, the soldiers left the cage, the, 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 the awful conditions of Vietnam, and they returned home to their families, to their wives, to their children, to meaningful employment. Um, and the vast majority, something like 97%, never used heroin again, despite the fact that they were using heroin on a daily basis, right? This very much belies our understanding of addiction, or at least a very conventional understanding of addiction as caused by drugs, right? So no question, drugs are necessary to, be, to cause an addiction, but they're not sufficient. And there is so much more going on here that we have to understand. Hands down, the, the, the biggest contributing factor to determine whether or not a person will experience an addiction in their lifetime is genetics. Bar none, without question, by a large, large margin. Probably most of you all knew this, um, knew that there was a genetic component, but I'm willing to bet that what some of you may not have known 
is the extent to which addiction is genetic. So in the research world, we do twin studies and we do some fancy statistical analysis to get something called proportion of variance, which essentially says how much of the variable of genetic, uh, how much of um, genetics explains whether or not a person will get addicted. Um, in other words, in, in plain terms, how much of addiction is caused by genetics? It's essentially, it's an approximation of that. And when we do these twin studies, we find that about 50% of the variance in addiction is explained by genetics. So to put that in context for you, we say that uh, breast cancer is genetic, and that's true. There's an irritable component to breast cancer. But when we do similar twin studies, we find that about 8%, so 0.8% of the variance in breast cancer is explained by genetics, right? In addiction, it's more than five times as genetic. We could almost call it a genetic disorder by itself. Um, so it's important to understand that, right? That half of your risk for addiction is decided for you the moment you come out of your mother's womb. But that still begs the question, there's another 50% to explain whether or not people become addicted. And a big contributing factor, probably the second biggest contributing factor is gonna be mental illness. You all know this very well, working in the field. So. If we went out into your community in Topeka, Kansas, let's say, and surveyed the general population, about 13% of those folks would endorse that, yes, they have experienced addiction at some point in their lifetime. But if you went to your local psychiatric unit at your local hospital and you gave that same survey, you'd find that rate doubled to almost 27% of those folks um, will experience substance use disorder. And so we call this the self-medication hypothesis. And that's kind of intuitive, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm biased in that this fits really well with my own experience, that I was having trouble managing something and I used drugs as a way to try to manage it and, and to try to self-medicate. Um, and so the graph on the right, the blue bars represent the risk in the general public there at about 15%. And then the red bars represent um, the risk uh, of having a substance use disorder based on having other kinds of disorders. So you can see there, for instance, people who experience mania as in bipolar disorders, um, are almost four times as likely as the general public to become addicted. Strong, strong factor. Probably the third most significant factor is trauma. And um, it's really hard to underestimate the extent to which people enter addiction with trauma, and then really the extent to which people experience trauma over and over again throughout their addiction, and lots of different kinds of trauma. Uh, but in particular, we look at the ACEs studies. So CDC and Kaiser Permanente commissioned a study to, a longitudinal study to follow a cohort of kids into adulthood to see how these adverse childhood experiences shaped their mental and physical outcomes much later. And it's a, a fascinating uh, um, studies. I, I would encourage you to read, read a lot about it, but in terms of substance use, which we're concerned about, kids who experience one adverse childhood experience drink alcohol at an earlier age, which we know to be a risk factor for addiction, they have a higher risk of both mental illness and substance use disorder. They both use and misuse prescriptions at a higher rate, which is interesting. Makes sense that they would misuse prescriptions based on the risk for addiction. But the fact that they use prescriptions at a higher rate is also indicative of the physical and mental strain that they experience as a result of trauma. And lastly, the one that I find most interesting and, and most compelling is kids who have experienced six or more of these adverse childhood experiences are 46 times more likely to use drugs with a needle later in life. It's a huge factor of 46, it's huge. And at first I saw, I saw that and I thought, that must be so uncommon, it must be so rare um, that, that someone would experience six ACEs. That's gotta be a tragic childhood, but I know doing the work you do, you recognize how these ACEs tend to cluster together, right? Um, a parent who has a mental illness is also more likely to be a parent who has a substance use disorder. So there's two that cluster already. If you use drugs, you're infinitely more likely to become incarcerated. So there's three, right? They add up really quickly. I had a colleague when I was working at an outpatient treatment center tell me that she would estimate, this is totally anecdotal, but she said she would estimate that far more than half of the women who come to our clinic have a history of physical or sexual abuse something we have to be mindful of when we're working with folks, something we have to be mindful of when we're tempted to take confrontational treatment approaches. I went to a treatment center where they used to put me in the hot seat and tell me what all my character flaws are. Well, take a person with multiple anxiety disorders and some traumatic experiences and then take a confrontational approach. It makes no sense, right? We've got to do better. 
you got to do better. The last risk factor I'll talk about is environment. You know, we, we alluded to this when we talked about Rat Park, but even if you control for genetics, children of addicted parents are eight times more likely to become addicted themselves. So um, just as in the case of adverse childhood experiences, you can see how genetics and environment would cluster together to create a whole lot of risk. So this is an important figure. It looks a little complicated and it's quite a bit fuzzy and I apologize for that, but stick with me um, because we need to make sense of this. So as we move from the, uh, from the top of the figure to the bottom, it's like we're moving forward in time. So imagine with me, I'll use myself as an example. Um, there at the top of the figure, I'm, I was born, and I was born with certain risk factors. And it's all these risk factors we've discussed already. A certain genetic profile, a certain risk for substance use disorder, for mental illness. I was born male, and being male is actually considered a risk factor for substance use disorder. Um, I was born into a certain environment, all of that. So from the moment that a, that a child's born, we can sort of index their risk, right? And then if you have the wrong combination of risk factors, it's gonna determine the kind of experience that you have with a drug. And I recognize that to talk about experiencing a drug is a weird way to talk about drug use, but I'm doing that deliberately because one of the points I hope you take away from this is because all of our brain chemistries are different, our experiences with drugs can be vastly different. And it's important to recognize that your experience with alcohol and drugs may not be in any way, may not even resemble the way that someone with a substance use disorder experiences a drug. And we know repeated exposure leads to these changes in the brain that can lead to addiction. So what we're gonna talk about in order to understand the value of recovery capital is we're gonna talk about the brain on drugs. This is where I like to get a show of hands for how many people have seen this. I hate to be the, the one to disappoint you, but I have no idea what an egg in a frying pan has to do with your brain on drugs. Um, in fact, it's, it was a part of one of the least effective prevention campaigns of all time, and I blame Nancy Reagan, and frankly, you maybe should do the same. We are going to talk about your brain on drugs, however, and I told you I have no desire for you to memorize structures. What I want you to do is fundamentally understand this process because it will impact the way you work with people with substance use disorders. So if you talk to an evolutionary scientist, well, first do this for me. I can't see you, but I'll trust that you're doing it. Put your hand out in front of you like this. Um, and wrap your, tuck your thumb into your palm and wrap your four fingers around your thumb. You've got a brain right there, okay? You can put your brains down. So if you talk to an evolutionary scientist, they'll tell you that throughout human evolution, our brains have evolved outward. In other words, your four fingers there represent your cortices, which um, are the most highly evolved parts of our brain. These are the parts of our brain that separate us from other species, that position us at the top of the food chain, um, for instance, it houses right here is your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which houses executive functioning. So your ability to make decisions and to weigh consequences and to forecast into the future. The fact that we were all able to agree to meet at a given time required prefrontal cortex activity. Um, if you peel back the layers of the cortices, however, and you go more towards the middle of the brain, right? Now we're going back through human evolution, okay? We're going back into evolutionary structures in our brain that we actually share with other species on the planet, right? And you get to a part of the brain called the limbic system, and it's also called the survival circuitry because it's the part of our brain that is most closely associated with our ability to survive. And it's really critically important to understand in order to understand addiction. So here's how it works. When you take any action, when you engage in any behavior that promotes survival, that confers evolutionary benefit, that, um, that makes it more likely that you're gonna wake up to see another day, that behavior is rewarded in this part of your brain through the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine, right? The pleasure and motivation neurochemical. So um, you drink water, a little bit of dopamine is released and you feel good, so you're more likely to, to drink water again in the future. You eat food and a little more dopamine is released and you're even more motivated and rewarded um, to pursue food. Um, sex, you know, you have an orgasm and you get an, a flood of dopamine, right? An absolute rush of dopamine that's pretty difficult to compete with, except for in the case of drugs. Um, and so all of these things, it's just, like, um, it's just like teaching your dog to go to the bathroom outside and every time he pees outside, you, you hit the clicker or you give him a treat, right? You condition him to continue that behavior. Our brains are conditioning us for survival, okay? It's a beautiful system. It's an elegant system. Um, 
In fact, you know, I've given this example before, forgive me, but I genuinely in my heart don't really like children. I don't have children. I'm sure I would like your children. Please don't be offended, but I just don't. And part of the reason I don't is because they're such unbelievably selfish little beings, right? And if you're a parent, you know this. And I'm always amazed at how mothers are able to care for a child who takes and takes and takes and doesn't give. And um, I've singled out mothers there. It could be any caregiver, fathers as well. I'm sorry for that, but uh, primarily mothers in most cases. The reason that mothers are able to do that in part, uh, apart from just being better than men everywhere, which I believe to be true, is also because when um, the child's face registers in the mother's brain, it actually promotes the release of dopamine which encourages the mother to engage in caregiving activities. It actually promotes the survival of the child and the mother. Um, in a way, you could sort of think of it like mother getting high by looking at her child, right? It's an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, pretty cool structure, but it's a huge problem in terms of addiction. And here's how it works. Um, so you're exposed to a substance. I'm gonna use myself as an example. I got exposed to an opioid at 18 years old and I got the positive reward. So DA represents dopamine, and I'm here to tell you all that I got a flood of dopamine from opioids that is unnatural. And I use the word unnatural deliberately because there is no behavior that I can engage in in the natural world that's ever gonna bring me the same dopaminergic response, the same amount of dopamine that I got from that pill, all right? That means no amount of Krispy Kreme donuts, no amount of sex, it doesn't matter, right? Social bonding, connecting with people requires dopamine doesn't matter if I have all the friends in the world, it can't compete with what I got from that drug. So I'm already inclined to repeat the behavior because even though my cortices, the more highly evolved parts of my brain probably recognize, hey, that pill is not actually important to our survival. It's artificial, it's giving you an artificial good feeling. My limbic system doesn't know that, doesn't have the capacity for understanding that. My, my limbic system only measures the world in terms of dopaminergic response, in terms of how much dopamine did we get. And so if that opioid gave me a ton of dopamine, it necessarily must be critical to my survival and damn it, I'm gonna pursue it. But where addiction really sets in is that our brains and our bodies are always trending towards homeostasis, which is just a sense of balance. So even though you might think that your brain would like these huge spikes of, of pleasure, of reward, it really doesn't because that's so volatile up and down and up and down. So what your brain tries to do is adjust on its own. It sort of um, habituates. And this is a process called dopamine down regulation. So it's, it's, it's uh, allowing for less available dopamine in the brain. So now when you use, instead of getting really high, right, you come into balance. And this is, this is essentially what we know as, of as tolerance as well. This is why you require more and more of a substance to achieve the desired effect. So I was headed to Virginia Tech a couple years ago to give this presentation and I was sitting there the night before thinking about how critical it is that people understand this process. So I created a really crude graph um, it's this arbitrary scale of zero to 10 um, in terms of dopamine activity. There are no units here, but you can imagine that I, my baseline is a five on a scale of zero to 10, right? I wake up at a five. That's what normal balanced homeostasis is. And I get exposed to an opioid and I get that unnatural release of dopamine. Never in my life have I felt so good. I'm at a 10, right? But the effects of the drug wear off and I return to baseline. Now I'm inclined to use it again because I, 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 I am convinced, my limbic system is convinced that it's necessary for my survival, like food and water, right? So I use again, feel great. The effects of the drug wear off, I come back down to baseline. But over time, through a period of, of using, um, you know, every day, every week, every month, and every year, my brain starts to adjust because it doesn't like the volatility of these spikes that you see on the screen here. So instead, what it does is it downregulates, like we talked about. So now when I use a drug, I still feel really, really good, but I don't feel quite as good as I used to, right? So you hear people in addiction and recovery talk about chasing the first high. This is exactly the phenomenon they're talking about. And interestingly enough, it's not psychological. It's not made up in their head. It's a neurochemical reality. They're actually not able to get the same reward that they used to get. And just as importantly now, when the effects of the drug wear off, you don't just return to baseline, you return slightly below baseline kind of a new normal that's, you're a little bit irritable, you're a little bit anxious, you're a little bit depressed, but we're talking about early, early stage addiction here. So we're talking about someone who probably hasn't experienced significant social or legal or occupational consequences, um, but they're off when they don't have a drug on board, right? 
And so this process repeats itself over and over again of using and coming down and using and coming down. The entire time, dopamine is trending downward, it's downregulating, until you reach a point in your addiction at the, at the end, an end stage addiction where you have to use a drug to feel the way you used to feel when you woke up in the morning. So I don't like the term functioning alcoholic or functioning addict. I think they're stigmatizing, and we'll talk about that at the end as well. But that's essentially what this is referring to. Now I need a drug. Because of this dopamine downregulation process, I now need a drug in order to function, right? And now when I can't get my hands on a drug because I get locked up or I go to treatment or I'm just trying to abstain, I feel miserable. I feel miserable on a level that most people I genuinely believe cannot comprehend. The kind of psychological distress it is to be in this place. And I'm not just talking about withdrawals. I'm gonna say a brief word about withdrawals, but the point that I'm hoping to make here today about what's happening in the brain goes far, far beyond withdrawals, okay? So now we've looked at this process in words, we've looked at it on a graph. I wanna show you brain scans. These are called positron emission tomographies. So you're looking at a cross-sectional, it's almost like you cut somebody's head this way. You're looking at cross-sectional composites of dopamine activity on a particular receptor site. So this is the D2 dopamine receptor. The brain on the left is a control, so that's a healthy person's brain. Um, I'm, on one hand, I'm inclined to say that may look like your all's brains, but I don't know how hard you party on the weekend, and if you're hard partiers, maybe it doesn't, I can't say. Um, but that brain on the left is a normal, healthy control brain. Um, so let's, let's unpack the significance of that. How does that brain on the left experience the world? Okay, so that person um, sits down to eat some food and there's enough dopamine in their brain to reward eating food. So like if they eat a hot dog, um, good old big juicy ballpark Kansas City Royals hot dog, right? Um, they experience some dopamine release that, that um, rewards, that both motivates and rewards that behavior, right? Um, that's a normal, healthy brain. That person sits down with a friend to drink a cup of coffee and have a conversation. The caffeine triggers the release of some dopamine, so they feel good. Um, the, the social connectedness actually triggers the release of dopamine, so they feel good. So they're motivated, so they walk away from that interaction with their friend saying, I love that guy. I feel close to him, you know? Compare that to the way that this brain on the right will experience the world. This brain on the right is a composite of people who are addicted to cocaine. And you can see that this dopamine downregulation process has taken place in the brain. There's very little bioavailable dopamine in this brain. And what's the consequence of that? Well, this person looks at the hot dog, and the hot dog is no longer a sufficient stimulus um, to bring about reward because they don't have enough dopamine in their brain. Does that make sense? There's not enough dopamine. The hot dog is only going to give them a little bump. It's not going to give them a, enough of a bump to get them where they need to be to really experience pleasure and reward. And as a result, people become demotivated to eat. So think about your stereotype of someone who's addicted. What do they look like? Um, they're gaunt and malnourished. Of course they are, right? Because food is no longer a sufficient stimulus to a downregulated brain, a dopamine downregulated brain. The person on the right um, goes to, to have a cup of coffee with a friend and a conversation. Maybe the caffeine knocks loose a little bit of dopamine. What's available in there? Probably not. Um, and the, the social interaction is numbing. It is empty. It's so hard to describe what it's like to try to experience social connection when you don't have the neurochemical you need to experience social connection. So um, it's just really difficult, right? Those, those early recovery social interactions. So what is your, your stereotype of someone who's addicted? Do they have big, robust social networks and lots of friends? Well, of course not, right? They tend to isolate, and why? because they're no longer getting rewards from social interactions. Um, believe it or not, all day long, you all are getting rewards. I am getting rewards when I interact with people, um, not someone who's addicted. We see this in what, all of what we would call the drugs of abuse. Um, so cocaine, meth, heroin, alcohol. The only drugs that don't seem to act on the reward pathway in this way are psychedelics. So like um, psilocybin mushrooms or LSD. I'm gonna give you another way of thinking about this. Same thing, we're looking at PET scans, but this time the brain on the left, the control brain, is not someone who doesn't use drugs. This is someone whose body mass index registers as healthy or normal. The brain on the right is a composite of folks whose body mass index registers as obese, right? 
So let's, let's compare the way that these two brains will experience the world. And please note, the same phenomenon is happening here. It's not as pronounced as in the case of cocaine, which we would expect, but something similar is happening here, right? There's definitely a difference. So the brain on the left, someone with a normal healthy brain, um, sits down to eat a 500 calorie. Okay, let me say first, I'm oversimplifying this process. So serotonin and some of the other neurochemicals play a role in feeling satiated and in mood. We have to simplify this for the sake of time. Um, so we're just gonna look at dopamine activity. So the brain on the left goes to eat a 500 calorie meal and those 500 calories are both sufficiently motiv motivating but also sufficiently rewarding to a healthy brain such that that person will eat the meal and then push their plate away and say, ah, I feel good, I feel satisfied, I feel pleased. Compare that to the experience of the brain on the right. These are folks whose body mass index registers as obese. You can see that their brains, not their bodies, their brains are different. And uh, how would that person experience the same thing? That person looks at a 500 calorie meal and it's not sufficient, um, it's not, it, it may be sufficiently motivating, it's not sufficiently rewarding. And so what they do as a consequence is overeat, right? If 500 calories isn't gonna bring you satisfaction, you gotta eat 750. And the reason I like to use this example is because um, I have a family member who struggles with her weight and I've, I've watched the lifelong struggle she's had with her weight. And um, I've seen her try everything that she could try, work with a nutritionist, work with a personal trainer, do all the things that people suggest. And then I've heard the things that people say. And what they do is they moralize obesity and they always make her weight out to be a consequence of choice. Always, that's the undercurrent in the language that I hear from people, that she is gluttonous or lacks self-control or doesn't take care of herself, like she's choosing this. When what I know, is she is having a different experience with food than I am, right? And people who have substance use disorders tend to have different experiences with drugs. And really part of the reason for that, again, we don't have time to go into everything, is genetics. One of the, the risk factors within genetics is a risk for a particular allele, which is a particular um, genetic variation that causes you to be born in a down-regulated state. So it actually causes your brain to be born a little more like the brain on the right here than the brain on the left, which means what? You're an unhappy person. And we all know people who are just, um, by default, not happy people. It's not a choice. People are not choosing misery. No one would choose misery, right? We all opt for pleasure over pain. Those folks don't have the neurochemistry that they need. All right, <clears throat> so we all know about withdrawals. You know, this, we don't need to talk about withdrawals. What I want to talk about in particular is this last word on the screen, which is anhedonia. So if you break down the constituent parts of that word, an means not, hedonia means pleasure. So it means no pleasure. It is exactly the descriptor that we use to describe this brain on the right. It is in a state of anhedonia. That is a brain that is unable to experience pleasure. The only thing that is going to bring about pleasure in that brain is going to be cocaine. And you have to remember when you're working with people in early recovery that that is the state of mind, not, not the state of psychological mind, the state of their neurochemistry about which they have no control, right? They're in a state of downregulation that means they are freaking miserable. Not by choice. So why are relapse rates so high? Why is it that treatment professionals, you all, do such a tremendous job of working with people in an acute setting? two weeks, 30 days, 90 days, you do these incredible things, you see these incredible transformations in the short term, we release people back into the community, and they relapse. Why is that? It's because of this anhedonia, right? So this is the last brain scan I'm gonna show you, but it's the most important of them all. So the brain on the far left, again, is a normal, healthy control brain. The brain in the middle looks just like the brain that I showed you before that's addicted, right? Compare that brain on the right, to that brain in the middle, very similar, right? But here's the catch. That brain in the middle is actually a composite of people who are addicted to methamphetamine and they're now 30 days sober, 30 days abstinent. Despite the fact that they're 30 days abstinent, they absolutely unequivocally have an addicted brain. Make no mistake about it, that is an addicted brain. That is an addicted brain that's gonna make addicted decisions. There's no question about it. And so you have to think, this is someone who's been let out of a 30-day treatment center. We've probably just had a graduation for them. 
instead of a commencement ceremony, we had a graduation and we suggested to them that the hard part's over. You did the 30 days, you're good to go. I'm gonna tell you all that is the biggest lie in our discipline, it is the biggest lie. Now look at the brain on the far right. That's the brain of someone who was addicted to methamphetamine and now they've been abstinent for two years. No weekends or holidays or days off. Two years, continuous absence. What do you notice? The brain on the far right much more nearly approximates the healthy control brain, right? And yet it's still not fully healed after two years of continuous abstinence. After two years of continuous abstinence, people still have brains that are compromised. People are still in our communities with limited resources trying to make choices with still compromised choosers. And what makes things all the worse is we let people out, that brain in the middle, we let people out of treatment with a brain that looks like that, completely addicted. We expect them to make sober decisions. And when, when, when they don't, we tell them it's their fault. We tell them they made a choice. We tell them they love drugs more than their kids and we incarcerate them or we send them back to treatment again. That's not the way, my friends. That's not the way. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit for the sake of time. Um, what you're looking at here is just another way of trying to reinforce the same point I'm trying to show you in different ways, but this time using statistics. So the blue bars represent males, the orange bars represent females. We're looking at the likelihood that a person is gonna maintain abstinence. So what you see is people who have been abstinent so far for less than a year, anywhere between one and 12 months, only about 35% are gonna maintain abstinence. That means 65% are gonna relapse, and that's probably not surprising you all see that every day in the field. What's important is somewhere between three and five years, there's a sort of plateau effect where your risk of relapsing drops below 15%. And the reason that's a critical value for us is because as I told you earlier in the presentation, 15% is approximately the risk of addiction in the general population, right? So when your risk of relapse drops to that of the risk of the general population, we would call that full clinical remission. Now, as you all know well, there's a debate to be had about whether or not a person can be fully recovered um, or whether you just perpetually live in recovery. But in a clinical sense, in, in the sense of risk, we would call that full clinical remission. So five years is the marker we're looking at. You know, if, um, if you're an attorney and you lose your license, um, you get disbarred because of uh, drinking alcohol or, you know, you're a nurse and you get caught stealing meds off the cart or whatever it is, usually, typically, the, the probationary period for professionals to regain their licensure is five years. And why do you think they chose that figure of five years of drug testing and management and um, monitoring? It's because the research says if we get people to five years, we can be reasonably confident they can take it the rest of the way. The problem is our treatment right now, our, our treatment paradigm is set up to support people for 30 friggin' days. 30 days, they've got a, a chronic disorder that they're gonna struggle with in perpetuity, and we're giving them an acute treatment. It doesn't make sense, right? And I'll give you a way of thinking about this. Um, my, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little for the sake of time, but about three years ago now, my father had a heart attack, and um, in recovery, I've grown really close with my family, probably closer than we were before my addiction, and I was scared to death. And we rushed him to the hospital, we put an emergency stent in, and they saved his life. That's an acute treatment. Because actually, I, uh, I went into the, the hospital room in the, and, and visited with my dad shortly after his procedure. I mean, really shortly after. And he was coherent, and he was okay. I imagine they could have released him that day, and he would have been all right. They could have just treated his chronic heart disease on an acute basis. But what they know is that if they do that, there's a strong likelihood that my dad's going to return in five years or ten years with another heart-related complication. And the hospital or the insurance company is going to have to shell out another fifty or hundred thousand dollars to go play around in his heart by going through his wrist, right? Um, so, so they don't take that tact because that's not a good return on your investment. So instead, what do they do? They manage my dad's heart disease every day. First, during the seventy-two hours that he was hospitalized, a nurse came in to enroll him in eight weeks of cardiac rehab. Within a week of leaving the hospital, someone called to ensure that he filled his prescriptions. A week later, someone called to ensure he wasn't having any adverse reactions to his medications. He still checks in with his physician regularly. This is chronic care for a chronic disease. It makes perfect sense. This is the way we treat asthma. This is the way we treat diabetes. This is the way we treat hypertension. This is, I mean, on and on down the list of chronic diseases. And even though we know that addiction is a chronic disorder, that's not how we treat it. 
We continue to treat addiction with short-term stays in treatment um, and belie this long-term recovery. So let me be clear first before I move on that this is not treatment bashing in any way. I'm a person whose life was no doubt saved. I had a severe substance use disorder. Treatment was necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? Just like drugs are necessary, but not sufficient to cause an addiction. I think for many people, not all, treatment can be necessary. It's never sufficient. It's also not necessary for everyone, but it can be necessary for many, right? So what do people need? What does chronic disease management look like in the case of substance use disorder? Well, it looks like access. It looks like opportunity. It looks like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It looks like what basic human beings need. I love recovery capital because it's so intuitive. So by definition, recovery capital refers to all of the resources, the, the breadth and depth of resources, both internal and external, that a person can bring to bear on their recovery. So when I think about my recovery capital, I think about the fact that I came from so much privilege that I had help getting jobs, I had help getting cars, I had help getting into school, I had help getting into graduate school. I have no debt. I got, a, I got three degrees and I have no debt. And that's a horrible, horrible brag to say out loud because I know some of you are struggling with debt. That's privilege. I didn't earn that by merit. I didn't deserve that. That was given to me. But it had a huge impact on my opportunity in terms of long-term recovery. Uh, recovery capital has, has to do with employment opportunities. It has to do with your mental health, whether or not you have access to mental health services. It has to do with the quality and quantity of your relationships. And perhaps most importantly, in some respects, it has to do with when and where you're trying to recover. Because what we know is that there's a huge diversity among recovery experiences. And whether you're recovering in Eastern Kentucky and Appalachia, which is very rural, and very much stigmatizes any approach to recovery other than abstinence, you're gonna have a very different recovery experience than you would in Topeka, Kansas, right? So that's what uh, Voices of Hope is predicated on. Um, our, our organization is predicated on this idea that, number one, not everybody goes to treatment. In fact, the majority of folks recover without any, any assistance whatsoever. Um, so we wanna make sure we make room to serve those people. We want to make sure we make room to serve people who take approaches to recovery that are not based on abstinence. We want to make sure we make room for people in recovery who use medication. So we provide dozens of different meetings every week at our community center, everything from harm reduction related meetings to 12 step meetings, right? Both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. We did, uh, we have scholarships for people who've been impacted by addiction and recovery. Uh, we help people, you know, remove barriers. Uh, we, we employ recovery coaches who sit down with people in recovery and say, what's your goal? What do you want to work on today? Let's do that. Uh, we host yoga. We have sober social events. We have a telephone service where we reach out to people to try to bring recovery to their living room. We are the hub for recovery capital in our community. So whether you go to treatment or you don't, when you come back to Lexington, you come, you come to us and you come to us to access all of the things that you need to support your recovery because we know the time you spend in treatment may have been critical, but it's not enough. You still need community-based resources. You still need recovery capital. And that's what we do. And I wanna end my last five minutes here by sharing a little bit about language. This is kind of my third um, destigmatization approach. So this comes from a, uh, a researcher named Lara Boroditsky out of Stanford. And she took advantage of the fact that in different languages, um, not in English, but in some foreign languages, articles are gendered, right? So in English, when I say the word the cat, um, the word the is not gendered, it's gender neutral. But in Spanish and French and German, like in Spanish, if I were to say the cat, el gato, the article el is gendered, it's masculine, right? So um, Dr. Boroditsky was able to take advantage of that to explore something called linguistic relativity. And it's really interesting. So she gathered together a group of German speakers and a, and a group of Spanish speakers, and she showed them the exact same picture of the exact same key and asked them to describe it, okay? Two groups of people, German speakers, Spanish speakers, shown the exact same picture, okay? But in, and I'm gonna butcher these pronunciations, so forgive me, but the word key in German is something like der Schlüssel. Der is a masculine article. German speakers described the key as jagged, rough, hard, heavy, and metal. Then Dr. Boroditsky and the research team showed the exact same picture of the exact same key to a group of Spanish speakers, but in Spanish, the word key is la clave. La is a feminine article. 
the Spanish speakers described the same key in very different terms. Golden, intricate, little, shiny, tiny, and lovely. Very effeminate language, right? <laughs> and so it seems clear that um, what's impacting the difference in the way that they characterize the key is the language that they're given to describe it, right? But then some researchers said, ah, maybe German is just a heavy-handed language. Um, it sure sounds like it. Maybe it's just masculine in general. So they reversed it in the example of a bridge. So Dr. Boroditsky showed the exact same picture of the exact same bridge. In German, uh, the word bridge is something like die Brook. I don't know. Um, that's a feminine article. D-I-E there is a feminine article. So how, do you, how would you guess that the German speakers characterize the bridge? In very effeminate terms, right? Beautiful, elegant, fragile. For goodness sakes, they, they described the bridge as fragile, right? That's not good. Now compare that to, the, to uh, the Spanish speakers who were shown the exact same picture of the exact same bridge, but in Spanish, the word bridge is el puente. El is a masculine article. And they, they did not describe that bridge as fragile at all. Big, dangerous, long, strong, sturdy, and towering. So isn't that incredible? That's what, we, that's what we mean when we talk about linguistic relativity. We normally think that our thoughts, our cognitions, shape our language. You have to have the thought before you can speak it. But the reverse is also true. What this shows is that our language actually changes our thoughts, actually frames our thoughts. Um, in this case, the speakers were only to, able to describe these objects with the language that they were given. So if your German language tells you that a key is a masculine thing, you're going to describe it as a masculine thing, right? That's really important. So why on earth am I talking about this during recovery month? Because it applies to addiction. Um, John Kelly, Dr. Kelly is the director of the, the Recovery Research Institute out of Harvard and Massachusetts General Hospital. And he performed a study at a conference of mental health professionals. So it's a lot of folks just like you, people who should understand addiction really well, right? And uh, he created a clinical vignette, which is essentially just a short story about a man named Mr. Williams. And according to the story, Mr. Williams was in a drug court program. He tested positive on a urinalysis. And the question is posed, should we send Mr. Williams to jail or should we send him to treatment, All right? It's a pretty basic scenario. It's also a pretty practical scenario, something that people in community corrections face all the time. He tested positive, what do we do with him? And all of the vignettes, all of the short stories that Dr. Kelly handed out are exactly the same, except for one phrase. In half of the vignettes, uh, Mr. Williams is described as a substance abuser who tested positive. And in the other half, he's described as a person with a substance use disorder who tested positive, right? That's a seemingly insignificant difference. And yet the results are profoundly different. The mental health professionals who received that short story that said that Mr. Williams was a substance abuser who tested positive, were much more likely to send him to jail. But the counselors, the therapists, the professionals who received the vignette that said that Mr. Williams is a person with a substance use disorder who tested positive, were much more likely to suggest he get an opportunity to treat his disorder. And I love this example because I'm a millennial, and as such, I've been taking my, and my millennial friends, we have been taking a lot of crap from baby boomers for a long time now. And you know what I'm talking about, baby boomers. It's all about how we're fragile and we're too politically correct and we're snowflakes and we're marshmallows and we wilt at criticism. Here's what's cool about research. It's why I'm on fire for empirical evidence because this shows that it's not about political correctness. This is not about sparing my feelings. This is not about using pretty words. This is about the fact that language matters. Just like Dr. Boroditsky showed us, language really matters. And language matters because the way you talk about addiction is gonna inform the way you think about addiction. And the way you think about addiction is gonna inform the way you treat people who are addicted. So I want you, um, I, I just wanna urge you to be really conscientious about the language you use. And I offer just an intro, the, the sort of, terminology and the stigma that, that underlies terminology runs deep, runs really, really deep, particularly in our profession. So first of all, we encourage using person first language. Um, you know, saying black person and person of color by definition sound exactly the same, but connotatively they have very different meanings because when you say black person, what you're emphasizing first is a person's blackness and their humanity second. But when you say person of color, what you're emphasizing first is that we're talking about a human being and the color of their skin is secondary, right? 
in the same way, we don't say someone's diabetic. You, we, we can scarcely use the verb to be to say you are diabetic. Well, you most certainly are not diabetic. You are a person who has diabetes. So I identify myself as a person with a substance use disorder or as a person who uses drugs or as a person in long-term recovery. You'll never hear me say anymore, ex-addict, recovering addict. And it, and it goes beyond just identifying yourself. So for instance, when I described Mr. Williams, I didn't say that his drug test was dirty, which is something we commonly say in the field and something I'm certainly guilty of having said before. But you know, if you went to get tested for coronavirus today, I guarantee you that the physician would, um, would not say you were clean or dirty for COVID-19, right? They're gonna use clinical destigmatized terminology. They're gonna say you were negative or positive. And that's all we're asking. And so the last thing that I'll say, truly the last thing before I open it for any questions is, this is not just pretty language for when we're public facing. This is not just when we interface with the public, not just on social media or when we're writing. This is, in fact, probably more important behind the scenes. Um, when, you're, when you're having conversations with your colleagues about clients or about patients, that's when it matters because that's when you're shaping your culture and your ideology and shaping your approach. Um, so bringing it all together, I think um, reducing stigma is a way of trying to do away with barriers, trying to do away with those deficits. Um, and when you pair that with asset building, you have a recipe for, for long-term recovery. So um, I'll say here, thank you all so much for, for inviting me, for giving me the opportunity to come and share. I love talking about this stuff. Um, quickly, I am I'm presenting at the DECA Opioid Conference in um, uh, November and presenting something very different, some new research that we're working on, new paper my research team and I are writing, and I'm excited. It'll, it's kind of challenging the rock bottom narrative. So should be fun. Um, but that's all I've got for you today. I'm happy to take questions if you've got them. And I'll uh, let my, my namesake control that. Sounds good. <laughs> hey, thanks, Alex, for your presentation. Um, we did not receive any uh, questions in the chat, so I think you summed everything up perfectly. And I think, uh, yeah, we've reached our hour time here. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to jump in. But I uh, wanted to say thank you, Alex, for joining us today and uh, really appreciate your story and, and taking your time with us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, everybody.